Well, good day, kids. Shouldn't call you kids. You're not kids. You are mature adults. This is Dr. Winkler once again, bringing you the 23rd lecture for the World War I class. And let's continue to discuss where we were at before. Remember last time we were talking about aircraft. And I did say one thing about the importance of air power in the First World War. It does make for good flashy motion pictures, particularly when you have good-looking actors like Errol Flynn out flying these aircraft and being courageous and both those kind of things. But actually, the real impact of the air of the war and the air on World War One is not huge. <clears throat> it does get more important as the war goes on. But by the time the war ends in 1918, <clears throat> it has, even at that point, it has really not become an important arm of combat. But remember, for artillery spotting, for reconnaissance, it's extremely valuable. I was talking a little bit last time about aircraft being unreliable and flimsy. <clears throat> remember, by our standards, <laughs> well, Sometimes these things are a little bit more than flying kites. Remember early on, particularly early on, <clears throat> the fuselage is made out of canvas. It's held together by wood. Later on, you do get lighter metals. But usually when a bullet will go anywhere in the aircraft, there's not enough armor on it to defend either the pilot or the engine or the gas tank. So it can so it can be hit, and uh, some pretty severe damage can ensue. Remember, I said the men often took pistols up with them. <clears throat> One of the reasons for that would, of course, be if you get shot down, you do have the means of defending yourself, <clears throat> particularly if you're behind enemy lines. Uh, of course, if you're being surrounded by men with rifles, a pistol doesn't do an awful lot of good. One of the reasons why some of the men took pistols up with them was in case the aircraft caught on fire <clears throat> and they had a choice, either jump or kill themselves. And sometimes they got, <coughs> excuse me, sometimes I'm having a hard time this morning. Sometimes the aircraft, sometimes the men when they were burning decided that at least having the option of shooting themselves was worth considering. <clears throat> I was discussing last time why didn't the men go up wearing parachutes? Remember, a lot of their commanders thought this, this was literally defeatist. Now, this is a bad idea. This will give the opportunity of getting out while staying with your aircraft, fighting it out, doing whatever you can. It's probably a better idea. Now, we know that this led to a lot, shall we say, many unnecessary deaths because a lot of men who could have survived had they jumped did not have that opportunity. As I recall, having read about this, of course, the first recorded man who lived um, from a combat aircraft in the First World War by jumping out of a parachute, this took place in June of 1918, so it's very late in the war. There's a famous story about one of the, air, the British commanders who was stating that, uh, t saying to young flyers, by all means, stay with your aircraft. Because even if the aircraft's on fire, you have a much better chance of surviving if you stay with the aircraft and take it down and land. If you jump out, of course, you're dead. You're going to die. Very unfortunately for this scenario, that man was in the aircraft and he got on fire. Rather than following his own advice, he jumped and was killed. Let me say a few things about aircraft development. Performance, aircraft, this is, sometimes this is called your flight envelope, but the, it, what the plane can actually do. <clears throat> now here's some of the factors, of course, in performance. Climb, well, how fast do you climb? You start out a few hundred feet above sea level, uh, in many areas along where the French, where, excuse me, in France, where the both the Germans and the Allies take off. So how long does it take you to get up? That is the power of the engine. 
turn. Okay. In a combat situation, we'll talk about a dogfight in just one minute. In a combat situation, your ability to turn can give you the opportunity, shall we say, of either getting out of harm's way or getting somebody, or, or shall we say, turning the tables on somebody who might be attacking you. Drag. Okay. This is kind of like the configuration of the aircraft and how much air has to hit it. Let's pull up a World War I fighter. This looks like a sop with camel, I believe it is. Notice that when you take off, you do not have retractable gear. So this, this will be the case in the Second World War. It's not the case now. Uh, you go up, so you, you have to have wheels to land on. <clears throat> but, of course, once you're off the ground, then this is, this is a statement of drag. Uh, you talked about the piano wire in a different context. Uh, you say, well, it's just a wire. Well, it does. <laughs> There's a function of drag involved here. And, of course, you have to have support structures here and here. That is also a function of drag. Now, very late in the war, I'm talking the last months of the war, Fokker develops a monoplane. And the monoplane is held together largely by metal, not by canvas and wood. Because of that, he doesn't. you don't have to have the amount of support here. So the drag is less. Now, of course, as you well know, in the Second World War, almost every aircraft deployed in that war is a monoplane using one wing. Therefore, you have less drag, obviously more velocity. So climb, turn, drag, speed. Speed, of course, it's a little bit like climb. You have to have a, a, a lot of power in your engine. Okay. These are the factors. Can you increase climb? Can you... <laughs> Have good drag, have a good turning radius. Uh, can you reduce drag? Can you increase velocity? Can you increase speed? Can we say, as we look at these these aircraft ideals, that they're often mutually exclusive? You see, if you have better turn, often that means you have a better wing configuration. Now there are monoplane. Excuse me, I said that wrong. There are these biplanes, the two wings up here. But if you have a bigger engine, the engine is bigger, therefore it takes up more space. So even though you more have more power in the engine, you also have more drag. You see, sometimes if you're building up one, you're having a problem with another. Go back to the idea of drag. Here's the biplane. Here is a triplane. Okay. Now, notice you have more potential lift, do you not? Well, you're not going to actually go up faster. But you can see with having, let's count these. You've got three wings here, but actually <clears throat> the space between the wheels is also a, a configuration so that can potentially give you lift. You can imagine with this kind of aircraft, with this amount of lift, you could turn probably pretty easily. But going back to our comparison, how much more drag is there on this aircraft? So sometimes if you're trying to develop something better, you, 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 in developing something better, you actually increase problems with some of the other factors here. Of course, bigger engines, faster engines, more powerful engines are going to make a great deal of difference. Early in the war, most aircraft only go maybe 80 miles an hour. <clears throat> That's top speed. As you develop <clears throat> better engines who can overcome some of this drag, uh, as the war progresses, that you have aircraft that go over 100 miles, 120, 150, 160 miles an hour, those kinds of things. Now, they never get to the point where they have the performance we see like in the World War II fighters. <clears throat> the, <clears throat> the American P-51 Mustang, for example, in the Second World War, had capabilities flying over 350 miles an hour. Well, that, they don't even come close to that. 
as far as your as World War One's concerned. So remember I said there was more than 100 different aircraft types that were in use during the First World War. Yeah, <laughs> the British developed 65 aircraft types. The French developed 62. You see, we're over 120 now, are we not? And of course, then, of course, the, throw in the, the German development, including the Fokker the series of planes that he developed, makes a, can make a big difference. So we are still struggling for the proper power source and the proper configuration as far as the aircraft's concerned. Let me just talk to you a little bit about some of the people worth mentioning. <clears throat> The heroes of the air actually have an awful lot of press at home. Of course, the heroes in the trenches, people report on those. But the guys in the air are so flashy and so cool. And the idea of the man on man up in the, up in the atmosphere, uh, these, these people become celebrities and national heroes. One man worth mentioning is a German fighter pilot by the name of Max Immelmann. Immelmann, as you can see, is killed in 1916. But Max Immelmann actually develops a lot of the basic strategies we see in the air war. One of these is attack from above. You see, it takes a while. It takes a while to climb up thousands of feet, 10,000 feet sometimes higher than this. Now, if you're used to standing around at several hundred feet above sea level and you go up that high, you, know, you have a little problem with air. Yeah, you know, a little, little bit of problem with breathing. Something else I should mention is that the lubricants, they're often used in these World War I engines, um, were castor oil. And castor oil, probably a pretty good lubricant. On the other hand, it's a severe laxative. I have not ran across an account of this where a pilot admitted to this. But when you have those things blowing back in your face, of course, you, you do have something over your, over, your, over your mouth. Now, one of the reasons why you do this, of course, is to breathe better air. Another reason is to keep frostbite. You can imagine you're up thousands of feet and it gets colder as you go up there. Could you imagine also in the wintertime? And then, of course, the wind chill factor of uh, things blowing back on you. Fortunately, in many cases, the engine does produce some heat. So that helps to save you a little bit from the possibility of frostbite. But these men went up almost looking like Eskimos because they were so covered in warm clothing to make sure you don't freeze up there. Well, I have not seen a account where a pilot admitted this. But there's a possibility because castor is a severe laxative. Some of these guys could have had a problem when they're flying. Uh, they'll go through you and you're going to have a bowel problem. Uh, there are stories, once again, I want to see an account by the men who are there. And anyway, some guys going down very rapidly to make a very, very quick visit to the bushes and then flying up again. Air tactics. You want to be above somebody because when you're above somebody and you're coming down on them, the velocity of the aircraft is going to be greatly enhanced by simply gravity assisted. The speed will go down. Something else you want to do is you want to be above them and come out of the sun if you possibly can. Now, that's not always <clears throat> easy to manipulate, but if you possibly can, get the sun in your back. The idea being, and you attack somebody from the rear, <clears throat> you attack somebody from the rear, and your opposing pilot is flying around, and he's, he, I imagine this guy's got a kink in the neck because you got to be constantly looking. If you get in a position where somebody's coming up on you and you don't see him, that can be extremely lethal. He's also made a big deal about being very, very close to your enemy. Do not fire from distance because there's all kinds of winds and factors involved in your ability to hit a distance. So you have to be close. You have to be very close. In fact, sometimes, you know what prop wash is? Prop wash is the air from your prop 
that blows back through your aircraft back through the fuselage. There is a problem if you get too close to your opposing aircraft because his props working if you get behind him close enough and then his prop wash blowing back on you on your fairly flimsy aircraft and that can destabilize you and it can cause you a certain amount of problems. Immelman is also famous for the famous Immelman turn. Years ago I was I had happened to have a conversation with uh, an American. He was a retired fighter pilot in the Air Force. You got to ask him about the Ellman turn, right? <laughs> He's still using this. Uh, I, I I had it right. He took, he, I, he said, "Well, what do you mean by Ellman?" I says, "This is what I think that it is." And he confirmed it. He was correct. What you can do with a jet, a high performance aircraft, is you come out here, go vertically. And then you turn up and over like that. Of course, now you're upside down, but just flip yourself over and keep on going. That's what modern pilots call the Immelman turn. Now, the Germans, or the, nobody had a, an aircraft that had that high level of performance. So the Immelman turn during the First World War was slightly different. Well, I was going to say a lot different than the one we see in modern jet aircraft. Apparently what the M1 did was this. You get somebody coming after you and you want velocity. So you head down. You don't just turn. You, you angle down for a little ways. And then having picked up velocity, now you crank it. And you turn around. And the velocity, and you crank it as best you can. And you can come around and get on the tail of your enemy. Now, apparently, Immelman was very good at this, and that goes to a lot of his success in shooting down enemy aircraft. He was well received by the Germans. He taught uh, a lot of the young men, young pilots coming up, his basic ideas, and how to use your, your aircraft to the best advantage, and how to use air tactics to attack your enemy most successfully. A lot of times we call these dogfights, aerial combat. I'll probably pull up dogfight and get a picture of two dogs fighting. There are a few still photographs that's actually taken from the air during the war. Now, most of what we're seeing right here, of course, are paintings, and it probably looks something like this. There are a few photographs that are actually taken. Now, since we can't see the color here, we don't know if this is a British or French plane, but the circular does mean it is British or French. Notice that this man's machine gun is above the wing. So this is fairly early before they had the interrupter gear in the Allied Army, the Allied Air Force, I should say. So we get an idea. You can see in the air, it can, it can be mixed up. I believe actually this is probably a drawing as well. But there are a few photographs that are actually taken by men. And if, if you're in, if you're, if you're in fight, <laughs> If you're in the air, I don't know why you want to pull out a camera for it. But we do have a few photographs that do exist, taken from the air during the First World War. Actually, I've seen motion picture footage of this, where they're obviously not in combat, where you actually see the ground of these men taking off. and It's really quite pretty, I'm sure. Looking down and flying around a little bit and going through the clouds. It's really, really a lot of fun. Now, the dogfight. I don't know how many of you have seen dog fights. <clears throat> dogs fight. I'm talking the animal. And one of the ways that dogs fight is to get to the rear. They, they, they want to literally bite the rear legs off their opponent in a dog fight. Why would dogs do this? Well, when dogs are actually wild, 
And one of the ways she, that you survived was getting a pack. Of, well, you know, jo dogs are actually genetically the same as wolves. So a wolf pack comes together. And when you attack a deer or whatever animal you're coming after, one of the best ways to bring that animal down is to grab the hind legs. And if you can get, glom them onto the hind legs, you pull them down. When dogs are fighting each other, there's a tend to be quite a swirl as they try to grab each other's hind legs. I guess this is instinct as far as the animal's concerned. So you take that idea and you put it in the air. And now your idea is to get behind the other person. <clears throat> this is very important in area combat, but we have to be careful not to overemphasize what's going on. <clears throat> you see, the you have machine guns uh, sometimes one but usually two right in front of you as you bank as you turn your enemy is here and he turns in either direction usually when the it is easier to turn an aircraft in the same direction as the prop is turning so the prop is turning this direction. The torque of the engine makes it a lot easier for you to turn this way. If the prop is going in this direction and you turn that way, then you're fighting the centrifugal forces or whatever they are of the aircraft. So if you're pulling up behind somebody and that person realizes you're there and that person tries to escape, he will more likely turn in the direction of the rotation of the prop. So sometimes you can anticipate this. He doesn't have to. I mean, he can go directly down. Well, see, one of the reasons why when somebody comes behind you, sometimes you dive. And usually when you turn, the turn is a function of a dive for the simple reason that as you're going down, the gravity is assisted, you can gain more velocity, perhaps not only get some speed on your attacker, but maybe even escape him. The point I'm trying to make is this. The aircraft here, you're here. And as he turns and you turn, remember there's centrifugal forces on you. It tends to push you down in your seat. But the same forces that push you down in your seat are also on the bullet as they come out. It's not just like you're shooting straight. No, the bullet's going to be changed in direction somewhat simply because of the centrifugal forces. The point I'm trying to make is this. He turns, but you, to, in order to shoot him, you have to be, a, be a sense in advance. If he's turning and shoot behind him, you shoot at him, his bullets are going to go down this direction. You've got to be, you've got, you've got to lead him. Well, if he's here, he's turning, and you're leading him, do you see you're out of position? So you're leading him, he goes this direction, and if he turns back, then you're off. Dogfights are important. The, the pilots talk about this, how we did duel with each other. But you can see it's very difficult, even at close range, to shoot down your enemy aircraft. However, even very early in the war, when people like Immelman are teaching young pilots how to most effectively dogfight. That more enemy pilots are not killed in dogfights, but in passes. Remember, you're higher you're from the sun if possible. <clears throat> you see aircraft down here, you come and you get as close as you can, you open up and you keep on going down. That's your best way to hit somebody. Who do you hit? Well, <clears throat> you got wings and the fuselage. The best place is to either hit the pilot or the engine. If you're coming up from behind, the engine is front in front of the pilot. So the best place to hit is the pilot. If you can come down, get him, you got the aircraft because he's a dead man. <clears throat> well, my <clears throat> I'm having a hard time this morning. <clears throat> See if I can clear out my voice so I can speak a little bit better. <clears throat> Um, it's not my point to go in and talk about the various pilots, Billy Bishop, Rene Font. There's a lot of people out there that are very important. 
But I do want to tell you what I consider to be an interesting story. Quite frankly, it's probably the most famous and most interesting story to come out of the air war in the First World War. <clears throat> There's a German fighter, fighter pilot, by the name of Ernst Udet. Except for Bernd von Richthofen, which we'll mention in a few minutes, he had more confirmed kills shot down, shot down in the aircraft than any German pilot during the war. 62 confirmed kills. One of the, there were a number of men that were better than, than Gunimer. But Georges Gunimer was one of the more highly decorated and highly effective World War I fighter pilots. As far as I know, as far as I've ever found in any accounts, when Udet and Gunimer met, this is the two best pilots ever to meet in aerial combat during the First World War. Now, look at these numbers. These guys are extremely proficient. They're awfully good. What was commonly done during the First World War, actually this was done by the Germans to a certain extent in the Second World War as well, you would actually put identifying markers on your plane. The most famous is Manfred von Richthofen in his famous blood red Fokker triplane. So it has been argued that if you're out, and a lot of the kills that Richthofen got were actually against the British. You're flying up there and you look around and you see a Fokker triplane that's red. You go, I'm getting out of town. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll do something else to test my skill and courage. I do not want to see if I'm as good as he is. That probably kept him from having more opportunity to shoot down more planes. Gunimer also has markings on his planes. That would indicate who he is. Udet had, <laughs> had written on his uh, on, on the back of, of his tail back here, German words. Well, if you're, fi if you're fighting the French, I don't know if they're going to be reading what's on your aircraft or not. But he said, Und du doch nicht. Definitely not you. Uh, okay. The French are coming up to shoot him. I don't think they're going to be worried about what's said back there. But this kind of thing is commonly done. Okay. Udet goes up. And in aerial combat, it's against the Frenchman. He sees that it's Gunimir's plane. He knows it's Gunimir's plane. So Udet versus Gunimir. Udet talks about this. They're in aerial combat. He has all of his tricks, all of his maneuvers, everything he knows how to do. He can't shake Gunimir. It's a dogfight. They're swirling around. Gunimer has him. These guys know when they've been had. He's been outmaneuvered. Gunimer's behind him. He's going to kill him. Just takes a second to fire that machine gun. And Udet's a dead man. Then Udet's machine guns had jammed. He has no longer the ability to even defend himself. Now, sometimes men would actually bring up hammers with them. Because when the, when the machine gun jammed, you're trying to clear the jam. Sometimes the guys would start whacking it with a hammer to try to get it to clear. Udet didn't have a hammer with him. If he did, he wasn't using it. So he's reaching up like this. He's slamming the guns. He's slamming the guns. And he still won't fire. He's jammed. And he's a dead man. Then Gunimer, Udet looks over. Gunimer pulls up. Waves to him and flies away. Is that, did that really happen? Udet said it happened. The real problem with this is that Gunimer left no account of this. As you can see, he's killed in 1917. As Udet lived, 
wrote his autobiography many years later. He could not ask Gunnar if he actually is, is, is this actually what he did? I mean, there's more than one possibility. Maybe that's what Udet thought had happened. Maybe Gunnar's guns jammed too. Maybe he's out of ammunition. We don't know. But in all appearances, Gunnar refused to take advantage of somebody else. Now, going to back to the idea of these the knights of the air, these men have higher morals. Well, <laughs> you want to look at it this way, you certainly can. I've seen this depicted in two motion pictures. A magnificent silent film called Wings came out in 1927. As I recall, it was the first motion picture ever to get the Academy Award for the Best Picture. It's brilliant. I, the, the, the shots they seen, they, they, <laughs> the shots they made in, in motion pictures that came out in 1927 are, are literally stunning. They're just aerial combat. A lot of brilliant things. This was depicted in that motion picture. In Wings. Was it 2006? There's an American motion picture that came out called Flyboys. It's about fighter pilots in the First World War. Also in that motion picture, this same instance is depicted. Where a man refused to take advantage of his enemy and simply waved and went home. Well, I have a little bit more admiration for Udet. Now, obviously, this doesn't make Udet look good, does it? No, it doesn't. It, I got beat. I got bested by somebody. Usually, when, when people are trying to lie to you in their autobiographies, uh, they tend to exaggerate. They tend to make themselves look better maybe than, than they should. So, criticizing yourself, what does Udet get out of this? I have to believe that Udet believed this actually happened. On the other hand, Look at when Udet dies. You see Hitler's come to power. Hitler started World War I in 1939. And of course, Hitler wants Udet as this extremely successful World War I combat pilot to be a, a top general in the World War II German Air Force, the Luftwaffe. Rather than do that, Udet killed himself. A man of integrity? I don't know. I do admire him. I also admire Gunnimir. Well, the most famous of all the, the pilots during the First World War fighter pilots was Manfred von Richthofen. Um, Richthofen believed that he shot down a lot more than 80 planes. However, can you really confirm that you shot down 80 planes? The Germans were actually quite careful. They do those braggarts all the time. You come back to the hangar, you say, boy, oh, yeah, that guy was right in my sides, man. And I saw the flame, I saw him go down. If somebody else was there and viewed that, that's something. But if you have like two men, the pilot and somebody else, see what the Germans call the Aufschlag. In other words, the plane hit the ground. Then you got a victory. However, von Richthofen, would very often, particularly when he shot down men over the German side, that he would go down and pull a piece of the aircraft, the insignia usually, and so he's got proof I shot this down. And in, back in, in the barracks, he, he had a number of trophies, scores of them after a while, up on the walls of his various victories. So we do think this is quite reliable. Other people, like René Funk, the uh, head, the, the, the most confirmed kills of the French, he might have even shot down more than 100, but they're not confirmed. Okay, Richthofen up here. Well, well, well. Looks like to me we got a board game here. One of the books I read on the war said that this guy was a, was a bloodthirsty killer. Well, before he died, in 1918, as you can see, before he died, he actually wrote an autobiography. Of course, this is a wartime autobiography where he praises me and the Kaiser, and he's bragging himself up a little bit. But I don't see a semesis a bloodthirsty killer. 
Now, we can make this argument, can we not? That there are many men that go up, and they go up over and over again, having no confirmed kills. But they're trying to survive. Can we say that when there's aerial combat, they have a tendency to, well, you just kind of drift away? Can we say those men that are left, Guni Mel, Rudet, or Heichtofen, that are staying there and fighting it out, they risk their lives for the opportunity of killing somebody else? Yeah, you could say that these guys are a little bit bloodthirsty. However, to take Manfred von Richthofen and put him in another category among everybody else trying to get up and do their jobs, I think that's a little bit unfair to him. It's a good book. You should read it if you're interested in the air war. Now let's go back to the triplane. As remarkable as this plane seems to be, remember, you've got a triplane, you've got three, three wings. You even have some lift down here on the configuration between the two wheels. You say, this ought to be a superb fighter aircraft. In reality, it's not. You see, it's good on the turn, but remember, you shoot down more people. Not on the turn, but on the dive. This actually even slows its dive down because there's more drag on the aircraft. Something else, if you're sitting right here, you have a wing up here and wing up here, that can block your vision. But the wing right here, which is right next to the cockpit, will actually block your vision even more. If you want to compare aircraft, let's go back to the Sopwith camel. Notice it doesn't have that same problem. You don't have the wing right here. Yeah, you got less lift. But in a dash speed, this is superior and you don't have this blocking your field of vision. Can we say that Richthofen, therefore, is not flying the best aircraft in the war? So even with an inferior aircraft, he does a pretty good job. Richthofen got clipped in the head. Um, sm small brain contusion. <clears throat> they patch him up. like to see show you a photograph of him with the wrap around his head for when he was when he was trying when he was trying to uh, trying to get him getting well any event there are photographs showing him showing his wound um, he was out of service for a while he came back in and he still had other confirmed kills after this time frame but there is an argument that maybe when he died, he was actually committing suicide. <clears throat> you see, after people like Immelmann are dead and out of the picture, we have people like Richthofen, who's the head ace and he's over telling other people what to do. And when you get the new pilots coming on board, a lot of times he's saying, look, be very, very careful. Your enemy's trying to escape you. He goes down and he takes a dive. When you are trying to escape somebody, one thing you want to do is fly over your side of the trenches at a low level. Hopefully the men on the ground will see you and know that you are, you are an allied aircraft or within their nationality, and they will shoot you down. But the plane that comes down with them are, is from the opposition, and therefore you have a lot of ground fire. So this is stupid. Don't chase a guy. If you don't even, if he's not even over the trenches and you don't get him, then you are low. And if somebody's above you, you have to have the issue of climb before you can get back up. So he tells men not to do this. When he's killed in April 1918, he followed, he, should I say he broke his own rules, and followed an aircraft down trying to get them when he flew over the lines and a lot of ground fire. There is a story that a Canadian by the name of Captain Brown actually shot him down. The distance that Brown was firing from is really too long to, to really say that he, that he got him. <clears throat> it's one of these things, you're too far away, well, maybe something might hit. So Brown was probably a little bit unwise in what he was doing. Brown was actually quite nebulous about this when he was asked. Uh, he didn't want to deny that he shot him down, but apparently he did not really think he had done so. The bullet that killed him, they did examine his corpse, actually came in the side. It's very difficult to believe that Brown is up behind him, actually had a ball that could come down and get him through the side. 
it was ground fire. Probably some Australians on the ground with their machine guns. Take a machine gun, point it up, shoot. He was alive long enough that he actually crashed on the ground. Of course, the Australians rang over to see who he is and take a look at him. And the only thing he said before he died was kaput. Kaput can mean broken. Also in German slang, however, it means dead. And then he died. Bullet went on one side, came out the other. Well, he's buried with great honors. Was he committing suicide? Uh, I'm not sure. He's the only one who knows. But can we say he did something very stupid? Uh, as I was already mentioning, ground attack, bombing late in the war. Strategic bombing, bombing ships, t attempting to. Uh, there are times when German go to bombers go over and try to bomb Paris. Uh, there are times when Zeppelins are, are used in bombing <clears throat> some areas in France. Um, there's some bombing on the Italian front as well. However, while, while tactical attacking ground troops and strategic bombing in the Second World War made a big difference, it is very hard to say that in this case it made a big difference in the First World War. Let's go back now and talk about, go back to the ground war, as awful as that is. It's pretty awful in the clouds. There was one man who did a calculation that the average life, the average age of the pilots was about 19. And he made a calculation that, this author made a cal calculation that your life expectancy was between two and three weeks. I have a hard time believing that because a lot of men who lasted a long, a long time. On the other hand, the death rates in the war, they are quite high. Now, let's go to the West. We taught, we left the West at the Battle of the Somme. Remember, it ends in November 1916. Not too much is going to go on in the wintertime. Now, I criticized the British at the Somme. Bad ideas, you keep on doing the same bad thing over and over again. And you have inflexible plans. Now, usually we take a look at the Germans and say, well, the Germans are actually a little bit better. The Germans do know the problem with communications. And so they give commanders in the field greater flexibility. If you are having success, if you see an opportunity, you don't have to radio back to headquarters and get the general to think about this and come back and tell you what you should do. The Germans, therefore, have more flexibility and at certain times they're more successful. However, the Germans do suffer heavy casualties for the simple reason that when they're hit by the French and largely the British, the Battle of the Somme and many other places as well, they counterattack. If your enemy is just going to grab the trench, they'll be a little bit disoriented haven't set up their defenses well enough. If you can hit them and hit them heavy and hit them fast, sometimes you can regain the trenches and destabilize them even further. But what's going to happen to your casualty figures? So the French and the British are attacking on the Somme. The Germans are counterattacking, making sure that the casualties were very high in both, in both areas, on both sides. In August 1916, the British realize that, excuse me, the Germans realize that their position is largely untenable. They're going to have di keep on having difficulty controlling this area because there's the bulge in the line. So the Germans decide in August that they're going to build another defensive position farther back and abandon this big bulge in the line where the Germans and the French like to attack. But see, if you made a decision in August, why on earth you're still counterattacking in August, September, October, and November? You see, just to grab a few trenches, the cost can be very heavy. So it's not just the British and the French that are making bad decisions. The Germans are as well. 
give you an idea what happens here. Operation Alperich. It's just a withdrawal. Let's give you a map. Is that going to help a little bit? That's not a bad map. <clears throat> okay. Notice there is a city right here named Albert. When I visited the Somme battlefields, that's where my hotel was at. No, nice little city. My first name happens to be Albert. So it was, it was a natural. I want to stay here. Well, obviously, they have. Uh, it's a very good place to be to get an idea of the battlefield. And I spent a lot of time driving around and getting lost and getting found again in various places along here. They have a very good World War I museum in Albert. I drove over to Peron. I tried to find the World War I museum there. It has a very good reputation. I never found it. <laughs> Couldn't ask directions. In any event, I, I, I tried. You can see largely the success of the Somme. We're talking a few miles. You see that there's been, uh, through the attacks over here, you see that the, the German lines have been pushed back. And it's true up here and here as well. But we can say whatever success, few miles, if you want to call it that, is really largely along here. Well, the Germans look at this going, my goodness, we're going to simply have more problems. So let's build a defensive line back here that straightens out the front. Later on, this is going to be called the Hindenburg Line by the Allies. The Germans call it the Siegfried Line. So they've got months to prepare for this. This is going to be built with, shall we say, the best of all possible areas. We're going to be on a ridge line. We're going to have good firing lanes. And we're going to have very deep dugouts. Let's get, see if I can give you an area view of the Hindenburg Line. Maybe I can. Is that large enough to be helpful? Not nearly large enough to be helpful. Well, once again, the zigzag configuration, which we are familiar with already. Another map here. <clears throat> okay. Let's, this is the withdrawal. You can see what happens right here. Now, this, this is a, a number of miles. What the Germans do, and let's go back, let's get rid of Richthofen for the time being. Let's look at what the Germans do when they withdraw. Now, they're going to be giving, oh my goodness, they're going to be giving up land to the Allies, and they don't want it to be usable. Uh, not in any real sense. Here's a, here's a photograph of cutting down trees. There, there's a motion picture, <clears throat> just came out a little while ago, called 1917. It's about the British. And the historian came with me, and when they're talking about the Germans have withdrawn and we're going to continue to attack, I'm going, oh, <laughs> we're talking about the German withdrawal in March 1917. And those of you who have seen the motion picture, I commend you. If you haven't, it is rated R. If you haven't, uh, I urge you very strongly to see it. One of the things when these two men are trying to get the information over to the British command post to tell them it's foolish to attack because you're being baited into a slaughter. They go through the, the countryside there. In one place, they see a bunch of trees that's been cut down. Well, I know what's happened here. This was in the withdrawal. The Germans cut down orchards. I guess, I'm not sure what they were growing. I guess you allow the Allies to have apple trees or cherry trees or peach trees or whatever. This is bad. They cut down trees. These are just shade trees for whatever reason. You would expect them to blow up bridges. They do that. And tear up roads. They do that as well. But can we say that this is another case of German overdoing it? They burn houses. They burn villages. They try to make sure that there's 
absolutely nothing here that the Allies could use. Well, if you're cutting down orchards, I mean, come on, do you really need to do this? So when the Germans withdraw, and of course the Allies come in, and they're, they're not very happy about this. Of course, the press comes in, they, as you can see, you're going to take a few photographs and get an idea of what the Germans had done. Once again, this is not the first time, won't be the last time in the war, the Germans make themselves look bad because this is unnecessary. However, let's go back and fight the war a little bit again. This shortens the lines. Go back to the, way back to dogfight, gone back too far. Yeah, shortens the lines. This actually frees up eight German divisions because this is much less length of trench line than is this line. And this takes away the possibility that the French and the Germans are going to use this again as a good place to attack. Now that's the assumption. What's wrong about this? That starting April 1917, the French are going to attack right here. So rather than attacking up here, they're going to attack right there. I have some irrelevant. Yeah. Now let's let's just be hypothetical here. Let's look at the Western Front again. If, where's my best map? If this, oh, okay. If this is a good idea, and I actually think that it is, why don't you just try this? It'll free up an awful lot more manpower and divisions if you just straighten out the entire front. Not just a section up here. How about if you just simply strained it out down here? then this bulge in France and Belgium would actually be gone. When that is gone, then you're freeing up a lot more troops. Therefore, you can hold this better defensively. This was argued very late in the war when the German military is collapsing. Well, we can't continue to fight out here. Let's fall back and have a good defensive line. They were falling back, but creating the defensive line late in 1918 proved to be unfeasible because the German military is collapsing. Now, I'm a little ahead of the game on this. Can we say that withdrawing, however, you are, if you're going to go on the attack, and of course they will in 1918, Germans are going to attack in 1918, that having this straighter line, they're going to attack right through here as well. Maybe it would have been better had they stayed here. Nonetheless, the bullet in the lines is gone. We met Robert Nivelle. Let's talk about what Robert Nivelle is thinking about all this. Remember, we met Robert Nivelle. We met him at Verdun. The guy that has seems to have a pretty good plan on how to defeat the Germans. And remember, he retakes Fort Vol and Dumont. So, wow, this guy with new ideas. Remember, Patan is having problems. He's not elevated to the command of the entire army. Yes, in late 1916, they get rid of Joffre. They simply give him another post. So the head of the army is gone. Patan would be the most logical person, but they're, con they're concerned about his mental stability. So this, this man who is successful at Verdun, this man with his new ideas, he's so optimistic. This is Robert Nivelle. Robert Nivelle has a few things going for him. Of course, he's a Frenchman, but his mother was English. Anyway, you read certain places, and they say he had an English mother. I also read that he had an English nursemaid. And whoever taught him English, he speaks really good English. You see, this is a big advantage, because when the head of the British Army is talking to the head of the French Army, and usually the, the, the British officer speaks some French, but it's not terribly fluid. And so a lot of times you have to have translators there. Nivelle speaks perfect English. There is no reason why you have to have translators there at all. He can speak very, very well. 
This guy is so optimistic. He's got good ideas. He wants to go on the offensive again. He wants to go on the offensive again. In 1917, I said that wrong. In 1917, the great breakthrough. He's got the idea. He knows how to do it. But then we have the German withdrawal back here. Can we go to Nouvelle's plans? Oh, where is it? Maybe this is a little bit more helpful. The idea was that this German bulges out here. Nouvelle's plan is going to hit down here or the British hit up here. In other words, have the bulge kind of pinch it off. But now the Germans have withdrawn. So that plan is no longer feasible. But he can still strike here, can't he? Yes. <clears throat> Other military leaders, political leaders, they're coming to Nouvelle saying, wait a minute, the army's been bloodied. Uh, we have reason to believe that this plan is perhaps not as good as you'd like to say it is. Would you consider altering it or giving it up? Nouvelle, the optimist. So, I, I am a man who knows about the military. I know what my men are capable of. I will get out there and I will break the German line. And he gives them an offer. If I haven't broken through in two days, he thinks he can bust through in one day. But if I haven't done it in two days, I'll call it the attack. Before I get into any farther, look at the date, April 16th. The United States declared war on April 6th. Of course, everybody knows about this. The United States has enormous potential as far as industry is concerned. The United States has a much larger population than does France, <laughs> like three, three times as many people in the United States as France. You see, the United States can bring over an awful lot of manpower. Well, are we getting a little ahead of the game? Maybe when the, when the Americans get their industry geared up to support their military, when they put millions of men in uniform and ship them to France, you know, maybe now you have an opportunity. So why risk anything now? Nouvelle says, oh no, oh no. We're going through. So the initial attacks take place on April 16th. The idea Nouvelle had is not terribly innovative. You see, what he had seen or said he'd seen before is attacking on a broad front. Remember, it's Battle of the Somme, the British are attacking on 17, 18 miles, hoping to gain a, a, a large advantage from doing so. That's a bad idea. Rather than having large areas, we'll have relatively small areas. Sounds a little bit like Verdun. We have a relatively small area. We'll pound it. We'll literally destroy the German positions. Then we'll bust through fairly easily. But see, one of the reasons why you attack on, on, on broad front is what happens to your flanks. And your flanks is actually protected, shall we say, by the wing of your attack. When you're attacking with heavy amounts of material and manpower in a short area, the Germans are on, your, on both of your flanks. Novell says that's okay because they won't have time to react because I'll bust through quite, quite, quite rapidly. On April 16th, he attacks. It is a typical slaughter. The French do not break through. Novell continues the attacks day after day. Rather than calling this off after a couple of days, what Novell is actually saying is, Wouldn't one more push do it? Maybe the Germans will collapse tomorrow, collapse tomorrow, collapse tomorrow. As the casualty figures go up in the hundreds of thousands. Every attack does not succeed. Every attack, oh, you gave a few thousand meters, but it, it doesn't break the line. It's just a typical slaughter, which we've seen so many times already. Often historians call this the Novella Offensive. Sometimes it's on the Ain River over here. 
So sometimes it's called the Second Battle of the Aim. Novell can't break through. It doesn't work. Bad idea. Now, let's look at France. Let's look at the French army. You go back, literally, from the earliest weeks of the war in, 19, in August 1914, and the French are suffering very heavy casualties. That's true, true throughout 1914. 1915, the French are trying to retake French positions. French ground, trying to break through. Well, large casualties, very little success. In 1916, France bleeds terribly at Verdun, and they suffer heavy casualties at the Somme. As you take a look at the French army and French casualties, based on the number of men in service and based on the national population, how much strength do you actually have in France? How much can they possibly continue to do? By May 1917, the French army has reached its breaking point. Sometimes we call these the French mutinies. Mutinies are not quite accurate. We do find divisions, large units, going forward. And when they're going forward as replacements or just be back in the trenches, they start baaing like sheep to the slaughter. There are times when they are ordered to attack and they hold back. There are times when they are grossly insubordinate. Now, they don't shoot their officers, but they're grossly insubordinate. They're told to do things. These guys say, I'm not doing anything. Certainly nothing offensive. And, and sometimes historians have said, well, mutinies isn't quite correct. I mean, the French army had literally collapsed. They probably would have shot their officers and simply left the trenches and poured on back. This happens in 1940. You do have mutinies and a French collapse. Can we say the army, a better way of looking at it is the army goes on strike. There's over 100 divisions in the French army. Over 40 of them are heavily involved in, shall we say, a sit down. As we look at the, at the entirety, however, there's some ripple effect in over 70 divisions. It's not the entire army. It's like, the, it's like they're, they're still willing to fight, most of them, the vast majority but they're not willing to suffer anymore for nothing. I've been waiting for years. The last book I read on the Nivelle Offensive was in 2014, 2015. Excuse me, it was written then. And I, wrote, I read it shortly after that. And they said, well, the, the information will be released. The French have actually said they will release the information in 2017. That's not the only place I heard it. I read it in other places as well. So I'm going, well, 2017 comes 100 years after the war. After the event, shall I say. And I can't find it anywhere. If there's a new book coming out on the Nivelle Offensive, written after 2017. I'd like to see what the author says about this. I have not seen that book. Are they still holding information? Perhaps. Oh, by the way, there were men executed. A few score men were executed for being treasonous in the trenches. But now you've got another problem on your hands. Of course, Novell's got to go. That guy's out the door. Fool, incompetent, never should have had the position he was given. Well, so then they move in Paton. Paton has a good reputation from the French army. Remember at Verdun, rotating men, and, men in and out. You don't put, push guys there for weeks and months. You put them for a few weeks, bring them out. Of course, he's the hero. Il n'est pas se rompe pas. So he has a good reputation as a man who's trying to look after the best interests of the French army and not become involved in so much slaughter. Patan looks at certain things. For example, the trucks 
that the that the that the I'll say it. <laughs> the trucks that are used to pull off the wounded from the battlefield and take them back to hospitals are not using the pneumatic tire. They're using rubber, but it's hard rubber. So the men, uh, it's a pretty awful experience to be wounded nonetheless, to be jostled all over the place like that. I mean, men are crying, <laughs> take me out and let me die. I mean, this is torture almost, being brought back from the front to the hospitals. Uh, what he does is he says, of course, the, the French men are living for leave. Uh, of course, if you can possibly survive until you get leave time, and then, then you get a few weeks back home where you can get some decent food and get some decent sleep and <clears throat> fool around with your wife, all these kind of things that men desperately want to do. Rather than having months and months, sometimes over a year with no leave, he gives the men regular leave, something that you can look forward to more frequently. And he tries to improve issues like food and sanitation. The kinds of things that other people, like Shafra and Nouvelle, had largely overlooked. One of the things he does is he tries to get the confidence of the entire army. This is one man. What he does is he gets in his car, driving along the front, and he goes from unit to unit. What he asks is, you could bring you could bring the officers there, but a lot of times the French troops are distrusting their officers. These guys are getting them killed. Who he wants to talk to is the sergeants. He says, for example, when he goes to units, I want a sergeant from each company to meet me along the road. You can imagine that there's scores and scores of men. And Patan gets up. A lot of times he stands up in the seat of his car. Sometimes he actually st stands on the bumper, a little bit higher so everybody can see him. And he addresses the men. I'm now the head of the French army. And you as sergeants, I want you to take this information back to your company. I tell you right now that there will be no more senseless attacks. This will not happen. You have my personal assurances. Take this back to the men in the unit and tell everybody in your company that you heard it directly from me. Okay. He does a brilliant job in a number of efforts to make sure that the French army is willing to follow him. Here's an interesting quote. I mentioned this to you earlier. Patton is, can we say, he's the savior of the French army. And he's going to lead the French army throughout the remainder of the war. And the army is going to be able to fight again a year later. In the meantime, the army is just licking its wounds. And Patton is trying to get the men in a position where they will follow military directives again, at least fight in the, in the, in the defensive and go on the offensive when, when, it's, when they're called to do so. <clears throat> as widespread as this was, the Germans never really had a clue. You would think something as big as this, influencing so many divisions along the French front, that in reality, the Germans would have, would have picked up on this. This might have been a good opportunity, had the Germans had the resources to do so, to attack the French army. Maybe they could have hurt them around more, maybe even broken down the French army. But, but they, they, they're clueless. In 1940, about 1940, when Bataille takes over and leads France after the collapse, of the defeat of Germany in May and June 1940, Bataille gets a very, very bad reputation for being a collaborator with the Germans. Rather than bucking them, rather than trying to resist in any way, the Vichy regime is known for cooperation. Let's not ruffle the feathers of the Germans. Let's hope, of course, that the Allies will win eventually, but let's not help them too much. Let's kind of get along. The Vichy is famous for a number of things, one of which is when the Germans decide we want to remove Jews to have them executed during the Second World War, that's the policeman from the Vichy, 
from the Vichy regime are out rounding up French citizens, happen to be Jews, to be sent off. Uh, this is something of a disgrace. One man confronted Patan, and he said this, you think too much about the French and not enough about France. Maybe you're thinking too much about the Frenchmen and how they suffer and not thinking enough about the nation. Very interesting comment. My observation is this. Is not the French and France the same thing? Can you really allow a Frenchman to die in the name of France? Well, maybe you can. At the end of the Second World War, Patan is tried by the French for treason. He's sentenced to death. But by that time, he's so old. Why bother killing this guy? So he's allowed to live out his last years in prison before he dies of natural causes. So the French are going to hold. That's what they're going to do. No more great offensives. They're going to lick their wounds. They're going to try to get themselves in a better condition. They're going to try to fight, of course, again in 1918. So the French hold and wait for the Americans. Probably what Nouvelle should have said in April 1916, excuse me, before the Nouvelle Offensive in April 1917. Well, now we have another issue. Are we running low on time? Now we have a little time left. Now we have another issue. I haven't talked about the British very much. Excuse me, the Russian front very much. And I will come back and discuss that again later in another context. But since the French are incapable of really doing pretty much pressure on the Germans, it's really up to the British to put pressure. Well, why do you have to put pressure on 1917 at all? Because the Russians are virtually on the verge of collapse in 1917. If you don't hit the Germans in the West, there's a pretty good chance that they'll have more units in the East and can do real damage to the Russians. It is definitely in the interest of both Britain and France to keep Russia in the war. So you've got to put pressure on the Germans. So Britain applies pressure in summer and fall of 1917. Now, I'll talk about this more in just a few minutes. We do have an issue of, of uh, Haig wants another breakthrough, doesn't get it. So it's not just you're hitting the Germans for the sake of hitting Germans. There are larger strategic goals which Haig has in mind. We say great cost, very, very costly. And now we're going to talk a little bit more about the agony of the British Army in fighting late in 1917. I'm going to quote for you next time. I don't think we have time right now. One of the most famous, perhaps the most famous poem to come out of World War I, written by a Canadian doctor. When he's talking about the loss of life in Flanders fields, the British are fighting up in France and Belgium on the north part of the line. In these areas up here, this is also known as Flanders. And the Flanders fields are going to be where men are involved in combat in this area. So let's leave you with that right now. Appreciate you staying with me. Remember, this is Albert Winkler, Dr. Winkler, World War I class lecture 23. Have a great day.